Good afternoon. I'm Keith Lindblom. Welcome to this news briefing from the 250th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Boston. Today we're joined by Dr. Jamie Donaldson from the University of Toronto. He'll be talking to us about how urban grime is contributing to air pollution. Dr. Donaldson. Well, thank you, and thank you to everyone for the interest in, uh, in my work. Um, could we look at the first graphic? So before we start, there's a terrible typo on here. Um, a name is misspelled, and I want to apologize for that. Uh, the person on the far left is Alison Bergen, um, not Berrigan. So my, the, the work I'm uh, presenting has to do with recycling of pollutants from urban grime material. And usually one thinks about uh, pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide and um, a nitrous acid, HONO, shown in red at the bottom, as being um, lost from the atmosphere onto surfaces. And so we see deposition of all sorts of species onto surfaces in, in cities. And that is believed to be a loss uh, from the atmosphere. And therefore, they get removed from air pollution events and, uh, and air quality chemistry in uh, this environment. What we have been interested in is to see whether or not the influence of sunlight on the urban grime material can in fact recycle these compounds and bring them back into active play in the atmosphere. And so to do this, we've done a combination of laboratory and field measurements to see, first of all, in the field, what are the constituents of this urban grime and can we find any sort of signature for photochemistry in this? And secondly, in the lab, what happens when we take real urban grime and shine simulated sunlight on it? Does it, in fact, release the chemicals we see? And so we did, first of all, an experiment in Leipzig, Germany. And the uh, people who were involved in that are Alison Bergen and Sarah Styler. And this was done in Tropos in Leipzig uh, and in, with the collaboration of Hartmut Hermann. And at, in that experiment, we measured at the same time the composition of atmospheric particulate matter, PM10, and the composition of the urban grime. And one would think that these two should be quite similar because they're both composed of chemicals which are in the atmosphere and condensing somehow. However, what we found was that the compositions were quite different in some cases, interestingly different. Um, in addition, what we saw was that when we had the um, urban grime exposed to sunlight versus not exposed to sunlight. All of the chemical constituents in the urban grime that we were measuring were the same, except for the nitrate anion, which is the precursor for the release of the nitrogen oxides back into the atmosphere. And in that case, the samples which were exposed to light contained less nitrate than the samples which were not exposed to light, indicating that these were being lost somehow due to sunlight. In my laboratory, we have studied both the loss of nitrate from real uh, urban grime, looking at the spectroscopy of the grime, and we've started to study as well the evolution of nitrogen oxides into the gas phase upon this process. And we have, in fact, been able to close the loop a little bit and see the same sort of rate of loss from the nitrate, so loss of the precursors from the urban grime and appearance into the gas phase of the nitrogen oxides. And uh, I was discussing this work earlier this morning in a symposium honoring Dr. Paul Shepson. All right, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? And I'll remind you, please wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation, please. From Chemistry and Industry Magazine. I'm just curious to know, to what extent is this a recycling back to the atmosphere of nitrate occurring? Um, what we see is that the lifetime of the nitrates on the urban grime, at least in the um, simulated sunlight experience in the lab, uh, is very, very short, about 10,000 times shorter than the lifetime of nitrate in aqueous solution. And so it is being removed very quickly. Of course, it's also being deposited very quickly. Uh, so we are in the process of trying to quantify the uh, exact nature of the compounds which are being released and to put this into some sort of model to understand how much it will impact our understanding of urban air quality. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
uh, Doug Dollimore, Science Elements. Um, doctor, uh, Leipzig and Toronto are two very different cities. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you're planning any studies um, in other cities um, and taking into account um, the different uh, latitudes and uh, climates uh, around the world. So about, is, there, is there a difference in sun, sun intensity that might affect the grime? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we are in discussions now with uh, Professor Jianmen Chen at Fudan University in Shanghai to try and put up uh, a field study there, such as the one that we did in Leipzig, a short-term one. That was uh, six weeks. Uh, we have an ongoing study in Toronto. At the moment, we don't have plans for other studies um, because um, there are there's, um, not people in my research group to work on this. But uh, perhaps this will attract them and this will, this will help that. It's a, it's a really interesting question, especially the influence of the uh, relative humidity as well as the local pollution. I think the, uh, in dry climates there could be very different sorts of chemistry happening. We have indications of that from their laboratory experiments. ACS News Service. So um, how exactly do you collect the grime and do you have an image of that perhaps that you could show? Um, yes, <laughs> good question. Uh, the, the experiment in Leipzig was done uh, on the, uh, top, the system you see in the top left hand side and on that system what you see is a miniature tower uh, on the right of the roof and that is used for collecting the particle matter and to the left of it, it looks as though there's a bunch of pizza boxes piled up on top of each other. And if you look immediately below that on the lower left frame, you will see two shelves which contain small glass beads. And these beads are made of the same sort of glass as window glasses. And so we are collecting the same, uh, on the, onto the same substrate as though we had been collecting onto actual windows, uh, which is what we had been doing in the past, but this allows us to sh um, collect much more because there's much more surface area on the beads. Um, there are two trays you see. There's an upper tray which is exposed to sunlight and a lower tray in which you see the beads uh, which is not exposed to sunlight. It's somewhat shaded. And so this is how we could compare the illuminated and non-illuminated samples which were collected in the same place. And uh, looking above again, you see that the little tower which collected the particulate matter is situated in exactly the same location. And so we could collect the particles which would have been, which were impinging onto the, uh, the glass substrate. And so this, the differences in, in the composition that we saw were quite interesting and indicative of different sorts of chemistry happening on uh, surfaces which sit around for a long time versus surfaces such as particulate surfaces which float in and out of a location. Uh, Matt Gunther, Chemistry World. Uh, I've noticed in your experiment that you're using glass beads to simulate windows, and the, there are a lot of windows in cities, but have you considered other materials to do these experiments on to simulate other things that will be in a city environment, such as alloys, concretes, and all that sort of thing? Uh, that's another very good question, and one which uh, others have, have asked me in the past. Um, glass is fairly-ish inert, towards uh, impingement from um, the sorts of things which appear in the atmosphere, at least over the shortish times that we've been looking, weeks and months. Um, things like concrete and asphalt and uh, bricks and mortar can undergo chemical reactions with the gases which impinge on them. And so this certainly would complicate uh, a straightforward interpretation of what we see. Once we gain some sort of understanding of what happens on a more inert surface, then we can try and expand our work to uh, encompass sort of total city surfaces. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry again. Just to ask, do you have any thoughts on what the mechanism is by which this recycling is occurring? Uh, we have some ideas. Uh, certainly nitrate anion uh, in its aqueous solution absorbs light and releases gas phase products. 
uh, much as we see. However, it does so with much less probability and much less uh, rapidity than what we see on the, in the grime. And so there's something to do with the nitrate associated with this surface, which is making this uh, much more facile process. <coughs> One idea, <coughs> excuse me, which has been suggested in the past for uh, nitrate enhanced photochemistry on surfaces is that uh, there could be a change in how the nitrate anion itself absorbs light because its shape is distorted somehow being associated with the surface. Uh, another idea which is, I think, uh, compelling given the nature of the grime is that there are um, effects, synergistic effects, if you want, with other compounds which are present in the grime. And so other compounds could uh, do a photo-enhanced or photo, um, uh, sort of a, an enhancement by absorbing light themselves and transferring energy somehow to the nitrate. Um, we are exploring that, but uh, this is very early days. Thank you. Ben Valsler, Chemistry World magazine. Um, just to check, did you take the beads that had been in the shade and then expose them to sunlight and see the same sort of change? I'm wondering if there's something to do with sunlight that affects the way that grime is actually deposited in the first place rather than a, a post-deposit change. Uh, we did not do that. Um, the grime, because the beads are located in the same wind flow area, uh, and exposed to the same gases, uh, there, is, there was no reason for us to suspect that sunlight a priori would change how nitrate was deposited. Um, and uh, certainly in the experiments, uh, the field experiments, what we did was take samples of these beads and analyze them for their contents. In the laboratory experiments, we have taken beads and, uh, and other, sub well, flat substrates we've collected and expose them to artificial sunlight in the, in the lab. Um, and when we turn the light on and off, uh, we get the same chemistry. And so exposure, prior, prior exposure doesn't seem to change things. Okay. But um, that doesn't quite answer your question, but it's I think it does. And um, the, the other question was, that, does this mean that we are underestimating urban pollution? Or does it just mean that we don't really understand the actual mechanisms that contribute to, to the pollution in the first place? I would say more the latter. Um, the total amount of nitrogen oxides uh, is probably, entering a city, is probably uh, well captured in models, perhaps. Um, what is not well captured is the fact that uh, the losses are less than people had considered because a loss from the gas phase to the grime surface does not constitute a permanent loss, just as sequestration. Thank you. I think we had a question on, in the front. Hi, Jonathan Webb, BBC. Um, you mentioned you did an experiment uh, in Leipzig and then you closed the loop in your lab in Toronto but I don't think I followed you all the way around your circle so I'm just wondering if you could take us sort of step by step in very you know not a chemist simple terms uh, through your the, the different steps in your evidence. Certainly um, I can uh, do this even in a in a chronological sense. Uh, in Toronto first we collected urban grime onto a substrate uh, on which we could actually measure the infrared spectrum of the, of the grime. And so we could analyze to some extent what it was composed of. Not nearly as well as we could do, we do it. And in that case, we exposed this substrate to artificial sunlight, and we saw the nitrate component go away very, very quickly. In Leipzig experiment, what we did was have glass beads exposed to sunlight and shaded from sunlight, collecting the same material. And the ones which were exposed to sunlight showed 10% less nitrate than the ones which were not exposed to sunlight, suggesting that there is some photochemical loss consistent with what we saw. Back in Toronto, we look at the gas phase products of the uh, reaction of artificial sunlight with real grime and see nitrogen oxides expressed into the gas phase. So that is the closing of the loop. 
So one, one follow-up question then. Do you have any way of knowing what sort of proportion of the gas that's being returned again, recycled again back into the atmosphere is nitrogen dioxide versus other oxides? We are working on that right now. So this is an, <clears throat> excuse me, an online question from Sophia Kai, ACS News Service. Um, she's asking if there's an equivalent of urban grime in rural areas, or is it just that because, say, there's not as much pollution in general, there aren't as many cars and things, maybe you aren't getting that grime buildup, or is there something different going on in rural areas? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, my colleague Miriam Diamond, uh, some uh, decade or so ago, collected urban grime samples and analyzed the organic composition uh, in urban and rural areas and saw similar sorts of compositions in the organic component. Um, less of the pollutants one would expect uh, in an urban area, though. Um, a similar experiment has not been done for the inorganic components, such as we, we have been doing in Leipzig. So um, I, my inclination would be to say that the portion of the urban grime which is deliver, delivered by long-range transport of particles might be similar, but there's a locally generated proportion which will be very much influenced by being an urban versus rural area. Do we have any final questions? All right, if not, um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the archived version of this session will be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live Boston. And please join us for our next press conference today at 2 p.m. on a drinkable book that can purify water in remote, pla remote places and potentially save lives. Thank you. <laughs>